While revivals of tried and true plays often seem to dominate the theatrical landscape, new plays are the lifeblood of the American theater. Hello, I'm Howard Sherman, executive director of the American Theater Wing, and joining me today are five playwrights who are regularly adding to the theatrical canon. Gina Gianfrido, Stephen Adley Girgis, Tina Howe, Lisa Loomer, and Christopher Shin. Welcome to you all. We're sitting here at the start of a new presidency and at a time when the economic situation in America and around the world is very challenging. I want to start by asking, how does the world affect you when you are working on your plays? And Lisa, I see you nodding, so I'll start with you. I'm often inspired by an issue or something I read in the newspaper that just troubles me and troubles me and troubles me until I have to write about it. So um, I'm very affected by, by what's going on in the world in terms of, of, of my plays. Is that true for the rest of you, Gina? You know, the play I have up now um, has a, Becky Shaw has a money manager character in it. And we did have to talk about, you know, do we have to add some lines? Um, to allude to this, you know, this crash that's happened, and, and in the end, we didn't because I thought, you know, it, it, it would date it very specifically. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, the, what's going on in the world certainly finds its way in, but I, I try not to name it. So, Chris, let me ask you: In your play, Dying City, which deals with Iraq, which was written a couple of years ago, do you think people's perception of that play is different now as the situation in Iraq has changed? Well, I just saw it in Hartford, and. What was interesting about seeing it all these years later is that um, the war in Iraq is going much better, whether we agree with the war or not. You have to admit that the levels of violence are down from what they were when I wrote the play and when it was first produced in London and New York. So it had a sense more of being a history play rather than mm -hmm. a, a current events play. And it did subtly shift, I think, the way the audience perceived the play. There was sort of more distance and a more mournful quality, at least when I saw it. I don't know what the audience was thinking, but it, to me it, it had a, a feeling of this is something from our past, which we have a little more distance on and we can look at, rather than in its initial productions it felt much more like the play was a, a very immediate trauma that we were all still mm -hmm. kind of grappling with. And now we've gotten off on the specifics of certain plays, but I'm just wondering about your mindset, your mood in the environment, and do you think that can influence your plays? Tina? I sort of believe that the reason we write plays in the first place is to find and spread some sort of consolation about the human condition, and that those of us who, who love the theater and, and care about human behavior are extraordinarily sensitive to the, the, to the wounds that we suffer every day, whether they are political or not. So I think we are all sort of feeling sentient, gelatinous souls walking around to begin with. And given that, when, when situations become grotesque, obviously I think we take them on. But I think part of what we do and what we are all about is, is responding to injustice and confusion and my new play, Chasing Manet, which takes place in a nursing home, is all about trying to console myself about the inevitability of becoming a drooling old hag myself mm -hmm. and being, mm -hmm. you know, lined up with all of these people in wheelchairs or crying for help and trying to see if there's any way I can console myself and also the audience in terms of aging. And so I think, I think it's very tricky because we want to we do want to respond to what's going on and, and what's timely, but at the same time, if we are too specific, we do become dated. So I think it's a real conundrum of how poetic we are in terms of our mm -hmm. focus. Well, let me follow on something you just mm -hmm. said. You, you said you write to console, in some cases, yourself, in some cases, the audience. Certainly, I hear other playwrights say they write to provoke audiences. Stephen, do you write to console or provoke? Um, gosh, um, I don't write. Uh, overtly to provoke. Um, you know, if provocation occurs, you know, then, then, I don't know, then that would suggest to me that there's something in, you know, the viewer that, that needs to be resolved. And when we were talking before about the politics thing, is that, like, I think, like, in, in London, 
You know, I don't know if it's experience for Chris. I know Chris has had a lot of plays in London. But I finally get in London and Europe, you get a lot more credit for supposedly being like politically minded and, you know, intending to provoke because they can't help but uh, interpret a plays through the landscape of us being Americans. So, for example, uh, Jesus Hop the A Chain was one of my plays. It was uh, in London. Last Days of Judas Iscariot, and all the reviews are always like, you know, Jesus is like, you know, his, his ringing condemnation of the American political justice, you know, a criminal justice system, you know, or Judas is, you know, his, you know, his reaction against the right wing, you know, conservative, Republican, American, you know, and those things might be in there, but it's not, I, it, 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 it's not what what, uh, what, what caused me to write a play, you know? What causes me to write a play is, is, is what keeps me up at night. Mm -hmm. I think Tina's right. Hopefully there is some consolation mm -hmm. for myself in the process of writing and hopefully in the audience. But the process of writing is without a, an agenda mm -hmm. other than to, mm -hmm. you know, chase that demon, right. you know? as you know as, as the stories emerge and you know it's like it's for other people to interpret you know or when you get to rewrites you know maybe you're like mm -hmm. well yeah I kind of would like to say say this I feel like I, I'm, I'm sort of like yeah I'm in the, on the same page consolations an interesting word because I never think about it that way but I do think of you know one of the reasons I write to sort of engage how do we live in the face of X, Y, or Z, you mm -hmm. know? And I don't necessarily know that I'll get to something that will console anybody, but certainly if I can, I will. Um, but I think it, I, it was interesting for me to see Hedda Gabler um, today from that, from that vantage point because it's certainly not a play that I think consoles. And I wonder if that's a contemporary expectation um, that we should be, be um, be not sent home hopeless, I don't know. I'm happy that one person writes to provoke and another person writes to console because I want to see all those different, I want to feel all those different things at the end of a play. I think for me, I, I know I'm happiest when people are talking after the play, mm -hmm. when they're just talking about um, what it's about, when they're arguing about perhaps what, what is the argument in the play. But I also know that the only way it's gonna, it's gonna happen is if I, if I move people. So I definitely wanna make people think, and I definitely, you know, I definitely wanna move them, and hey, if I can make, you know, if I can get there through some laughter, you know, all the better. One of the reasons people go to the theater is to find some sort of meaning. Absolutely. Because mm -hmm. everything is so random and nothing makes any sense, mm -hmm. so that our job is to create a situation that that sort of has some inherent logic to it, and and sort of the joy for the for the audience. Like when I was doing painting churches about, you know, a, an older husband and wife going off to die, and the daughter wanting some sort of recognition. We all know that there's no final dance at the end when the couple goes off to die. We all know that one of them is left alone and is screaming on the floor and, you know, rending the curtains and oh, biting the ankles of the visiting nurses. We all know how that ends. So that I think the reason that we write plays, um, I, I use the word consolation, is not only to, to provide an ending where a, a sort of a, a bearable ending that an audience can can rejoice in, but but also that we that we offer some shred of hope, and maybe it's because mm -hmm. I had a very Pollyanna father who was an optimist that I sort of have always felt that was my mandate, and not in a not in a hopelessly sentimental way, mm -hmm. but just some weird little blossom at the edge of the stage, sort of pushing up in the mud, and that, that's what we do. But what do you make of hopeless plays or tragic plays? What, what do you make of a play like Oedipus? Do you think that's a bad play because it's such a, a, a bleak ending? Oh no, I think it's um, I think the passions are acted out in such a fantastic familiar, gorgeous way that I find it exhilarating because it's familiar that, you know, <laughs> a father hatred and mother love and all of that. So for me, the consolation is yes, 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 I can feel these, these wildly primitive feelings and I can see them done in, a, in an exquisitely um, outrageous, gorgeous, sort of classical way and I take hope in them. 
but I think I may be a deeply sick person. <laughs> so, um, no, but I, I mean, that's a very good question, but I, I love the Greeks because it's so familiar. Mm. I mean, you know, that blood hatred. Oh, God well, I think, almighty. I mean, what, what I'd say is that anytime I see the truth, I find exactly. it consoling, yeah. even exactly. if it's a bleak yeah. uh -huh. truth. Yeah, exactly. To get in touch with the truth mm -hmm. makes me feel less alone, makes me feel hopeful. Yeah, right. and when you get characters into a state of acceptance, even if the acceptance is of a, of a very bleak thing, mm -hmm. I, I think that there's, there's hope in that. I think it's a... Mm -hmm. Or some, sometimes um, you have an ending uh, which is very tragic, and uh, I know I, I have an, the ending of a, a play of mine, Living Out, is a, a, t a child dies, people are bereft. And I remember one artistic director really wanted me to change that ending mm -hmm. because he thought it was, you know, really going to leave people in a very bad place. And I thought, well, first of all, that the ending was true to um, a larger political situation because it happened to me an ending between. Um, a it was about a Latino couple and an Anglo couple in L.A., and I thought that uh, to do anything more uh, other than that would have been to sentimentalize the situation, and that sometimes you have an ending which is not pleasing and not happy, but it, I think it makes the audience want to go out and make do better, you okay. know, do, do what, the, what they see that the characters couldn't do. On a practical level, who do you find you write for, really? Are you writing solely for yourself? or in, you're writing because you think it will reach an audience, or are you writing because you think it will get produced? Mm -mm. Gina, I'll ask you. Um, well, I mean, this comes full, we met at the O'Neill Theater Center, um, and you know, I, I was at the O'Neill uh, two summers in 2001 and 2003, and I um, came out in 2001 with a play that was subsequently not produced, and I, I think that a dark ending was part of that, but I, I was at a place at that point where I felt, do I want to keep doing this um, even if I'm not going to get the productions? And I thought, well, I have this group of peer playwrights I respect so much, and if all I ever get is going to the O'Neill and making them feel something, would that be enough? Well, I don't know that it would have been, but at the time I told myself it would be. Um, but I still think I am writing for those peer playwrights because I think they don't let me get away with anything. They know what my strengths are, and when I get lazy and fall back on them, they're, they're sort of my toughest, um, and they want the most from my plays. Mm -hmm. I write for myself, because I, the chances of the plays being produced, it seems, are marginal. Oh, yeah. And that's part of it, that if you write for yourself, and hopefully, you know, the, the shadow of, of everybody else, um, then you can be more fearless, and you can protect yourself. I don't know, my early plays all got attacked. My first play, Clive Barnes said, of the 10 worst plays I've ever seen, this goes right at the oh, top. Oh my <laughs> God. And so when you sort of grow up with that kind of attitude, there's a kind of liberation. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I have very good standards. I think I'm a very good audience. I think I'm quite a you know, discerning audience. So in writing for myself, I don't think I'm being particularly lazy, but oh dear, I think if you write for fame and fortune, you're doomed. Mm -hmm. You're doomed. I think you have to write for that, that little child inside that's crying for a new stuffed animals to dress, to dress up. I don't know. Don't we all write for ourselves? Well, I write for myself, I but I also want to reach an audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I want to communicate. Mm -hmm. We, you know, I just did this head of gobbler. It got very poor reviews, and I was, you know, very traumatized. That's not your fault. Well, it's but, not but your listen, fault. I want to reach people. I do this to reach people. Mm -hmm. And our director had worked a lot with Harold Pinter and Carol Churchill, who both told him, look, first of all, never read reviews, and second of all, um, uh, if you get bad ones, glory in it, because it means you're, you're disturbing the establishment. Mm -hmm. I can only go so far with that. I mean, I feel like <laughs> it's, it's like um, you know, political activists who say, I just want to be right in my political opinions, even if it means I never change anything. I'm more practical than that. I want to figure out how can I do something that's truthful, but that also reaches people and communicates with them, because I think that's such an important part of what we do, otherwise we'd all be novelists, wouldn't we? We, we, we do want to reach people mm -hmm. in a public setting and, and impact them. So I, I find I do write for myself, but I, I do think about the audience and how can I get in there? How can I impact them? I, I feel like when I go see a play, because I'm, I'm very open when I go see a play, uh, but I'm also can be very cantankerous, you know? And I, I feel like that when I write a play, I owe something to the audience. You know, uh, which is, you know, 
to not bore them or make them like regret mm -hmm. you know that you know 120 minutes of their life is gone and will never come back because mm -hmm. I wrote this crap <laughs> but, but that said you know I'm a member of the Labyrinth Theater Company and everything I've ever written has been <laughs> produced so I don't have that predicament yet that a lot of people go through so in terms of of me and it's because they're my friends or whatever and they sort of I wasn't a writer before I joined the company for me I write for myself um, but then I also write for a community which is in the company and then there's a community beyond that which is those people that I feel kinship with and then all and then lastly even though probably everyone at this table in some respect has you know an incredibly low self-esteem I know I do about things you know in some areas whatever I feel you know but I have a confidence um, also that, uh, that if I write well and true, uh, that my audience is anybody that mm. can understand English. Mm. And so that I, gotta, I gotta believe that until I'm corrected. And sometimes the, cri the critics will correct that for you. You know, as I, I mean, I, I agree with, with Chris, you know, uh, in the beginning of my career, I, I, it was like Teflon, everything, all the reviews were just great. And, and then once you disappoint them, you know, I remember, you know, my last play, uh, very well-known critic uh, said, the uh, Little Flower of East Orange is proof that some lives are not worth dramatizing. You know, he also said of, uh, of, of, of another play, uh, you know, Girgis is the, what is it, the, 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 the example, of the example of the emperor's new clothes, being hailed as blah, 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 without ever writing anything resembling you know, a good or even finished play, you know? And I remember all of those. Yeah. I don't mind, you know, playwrights, uh, uh, critics that are, uh, you know, this is what they do for a living, and there's many excellent ones. You talked about working within the community of Labyrinth, which has given you great opportunity to mm -hmm. see your work done. Where do the rest of you draw your strength from, even, even when there may be people out there not being supportive? I, I draw my my strength, you know, when I feel why, you know, why bother from the audience. Um, people who come up to me and often say, thank you for writing this, you know, thank you for putting my experience out there, or gee, you know, I saw this play. I once had a, I once got a letter from someone, and this is a very unusual circumstance, but who saw a play of mine and it moved her to get a mammogram, and she felt that it saved her life. You know, and I thought, okay, that's a reason to get up in the morning. You know, the hell with the review. You know, that's a reason to get up in the morning. I've seen people um, come to see the, 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 the play that um, I'm doing now, Distracted, who, um, who after seeing the play thought very hard about medication, about medicating children. Whatever their decision was, that's fine. All I want to do is get people thinking. And um, that, that's where, where I draw the strength from, when I know that people are um, excited or are engaged with the play. I, in some weird way, so, sort of the bad times and the rejections, it's, it's this weird Yankee thing. Fuel me, like when Clive Barnes said this is, was the worst ever, I thought, you ain't seen nothing yet, you know, <laughs> and it sort of inspired me to, to get friskier. Right. And I don't know, there's something, there's some wild, fire in me that just won't rest and I'm getting very old and now I'm writing about very old characters but it's just some weird well it's part of the how family we're all very driven and I think it's genetic you know but it's it has no, nothing to do with anything but I'm getting to a, a place where you know most of my plays have been produced but I have a play that was in London in the in the fall that has not no theater has decided to do it. In fact, most of them have rejected it. And when your previous plays have been produced, and then places that have done your plays reject your new play, mm -hmm. it's very confusing. Mm -hmm. Because I think, well, I'm the same artist. I work just as hard as I always did. I think it's a good play. And so again, I'm confronted with that trauma of, why didn't I reach them? Mm -hmm. How do mm -hmm. I reach people? How do I be myself, but also reach the people that I need to reach to get my work seen? And I, I do find it, I mean, again, I think ultimately you always have to write for yourself, but you also want the plays produced. Yeah. So when they're not getting produced, how do you deal with, with, with a trauma like that? Let's jump back to some practical aspects about 
how you became writers. And I just want to ask you each in sequence when you realized you wanted to write and, and in particular write for the stage. Stephen, you already mentioned that you weren't a writer until you no, got involved with Lab. So I, what were you doing? I'm, I was an actor, and okay. I'm still an actor. Um, I mean, as a, as a child, I was aware that I probably had an aptitude for writing, um, you know, just from writing essays and stuff. In fact, I, I went to college with, with John Ortiz, who's artistic director of the company, and Liza Colon, who was in Living Out, Lisa Loomer's play. And I remember one time um, Ortiz needed an essay written, and he asked me to write it for him. And, and, uh, and he got an A, so he gave me a pair of sneakers. <laughs> you know? And then when I joined the company, uh, because we were all actors, we quickly became um, wearing all different hats. And I think John just asked me to write a play, and I wrote it, and he, people laughed when it was funny and got quiet when it was serious and applauded at the end. And then everybody just gangbanged me to keep writing. And I did it reluctantly, but it was a way because, you know, if I think writers usually have something inside them that's, you know, I always say what you can't say to, you know, your friends, your therapist, uh, you know, da da da, da you know, that's what, what I, that's what I write about, and then I just try to disguise it as best I can. So it's like, no, mm. it's not me. Mm. It's just mm. I pose this to you. Mm. I was an, I was an actor as well, and. I was typecast, and I was very frustrated. What do you and think you were typecast? Oh, I can. The goddess, come no, on! No, 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 no. You were the I goddess. have a resume full of hookers. Um, for in, in, the, in what I made money as, I, I, this, I was younger. I had long black hair. I played Puerto Rican hookers, Colombian hookers, Cuban hookers, American hookers, everything. And I was frustrated, and I was in an acting class. Why? Yes, why? <laughs> because I usually had, I had one line, you want to go out? Yeah. And I said it, you know, <laughs> once I got to say it to Paul Newman, and that was the highlight of my film career. Oh, man. Um, and truly. And I was in an acting class with Win Hanman, and I would bring in uh, monologues, um, and I would say, oh, this was written by a writer named, um, you know, and I'd make up a name. And finally, Wynne said to me, Lisa, who's writing that mm. stuff? And I said I was, and he gave me a, a, a show um, downstairs at, at his theater, and um, I did a, a one-woman show, and that's how I started. And then I wrote for uh, a group, and I, we did political comedy at the West Bank, and then it just got bigger. And then I, you know, could step out and let the plays go on their own. And for a long time, I was very. Every time I would watch the play, I would think, "Oh, it's half hour." You know, I'd be confused. I got to get backstage, and then I'd remember, "No, I have to sit out in the audience all by myself." But that's how I started. Wow. I came from a family of writers, so I grew up. All of the conversation at the dinner table was about, "What have you read? What have you written?" Uh, it was very, very intense, and so it was clear that that's what I was going to do, except I didn't have any talent. And when I was at Sarah Lawrence and, and took a fiction class, and I wrote this little play, and my friend Jane Alexander was sort of the resident star at Sarah Lawrence. She read it and said, I want to produce it. I want to direct it. And so she directed this terrible little play about the end of the world that was just what you'd write when you were you know, a senior at Sarah Lawrence with pigeons on stepladders. And, the leading lady got sick the night of the show, so Jane went on, and it was a triumph. It was a triumph, this dreadfully pretentious piece. Afterwards, the, the audience burst into wild applause. I ran out on the stage and started throwing kisses, because I thought that's what you were supposed to do, <laughs> until somebody dragged me <laughs> off. And it was just like, oh, this is it. Because the great thing about writing for the theater is you don't have to describe anything. It's just. You know, you put two people in the middle of, of a situation and the fur starts to fly. So it was thanks to my dear Jane who um, helped me realize that I can't do fiction. I wish I could, but too hard. <laughs> a lot of fiction writers would say, actually, playwriting <laughs> is too hard. Yeah. And writing fiction is yeah. easy. Um, I, was, I loved acting and, and writing uh, as a kid. And then one day I was walking through the halls of my public high school and I saw there was a contest, statewide Connecticut high school playwriting contest. And I thought, oh, well, you know, write a play and enter that. And I wrote it, and I won it. And they did a little stage reading of my play. And I was really hooked. I mean, I, I was so thrilled by the experience of 
an audience sitting there listening to my words and working with actors. And it was the best of both worlds. It was a little bit of acting, a little bit of writing in one thing. And I just kept doing it after that, never stopped. I, a little bit similar to Lisa, oddly. I, I was um, you know, queen actress in high school, and I went to college in New York thinking I was going to act. And um, I was at Barnard, and I had an acting class at Columbia. It's not the only reason I got out, but it's one of them. Um, the, the teacher lined us up and told us you know, what we could play, and mm. he said, you know that I I could play ethnic teenagers, and, uh, <laughs> and he and he also said, hey, you're um, you're never going to be the ingenue, and I f sort of did the math. Well, then I'm I'm the other woman if I'm not the ingenue. I mean I'm like the affair, not the wife. Um, and then meanwhile over at Barnard, we didn't have any men, so we just we did Crimes of the Heart for a year, and we did you know Three Sisters for a year, a bad translation of you know. And at a certain point, I was like, oh, you know, this really just isn't working. And I had an internship at Primary Stages, which at that time was five years old. It's now a major off-Broadway theater, but at the time it was off-off-Broadway. The tickets were $12, and they were like brand new plays because Casey Childs, who had founded it, had come from New Dramatists. And so he was, he was doing plays that were new. And I got very interested in um, watching playwrights uh, rewrite plays. Um, in rehearsal, and I started thinking, you know, the the mechanism of, of how you take something you know isn't working, and you 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 rewrite it. I just got very interested in that, um, and I started writing my own, um, and that was kind of it, you know. So let me ask you: out of all of these experiences, we know there are playwriting programs and workshops and development seminars, et cetera, et cetera. Can playwriting be taught? I think what can be taught is you can be a role model for a, a young writer who uh, has their own drive and their own natural ability, but who isn't sure what to do with it always. Uh, so it's almost more like being a mentor. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and I find often what I'm doing is sharing with them how hard it is for me, mm -hmm. how many drafts I do, how much mm -hmm. I struggle, how much I fail. Because I think oftentimes when you're just beginning, you don't know if what you're doing is right or wrong, you have no context for it. And you look at these writers who've been produced and you think it's magic, they have some mm -hmm. extraordinary ability, it just comes out right, you know. And I, I feel like what I can do is say, you know what, this is really hard, and here are some of the ways it's hard, and here I can help you learn about the challenges you're gonna face in confronting yourself and confronting uh, what you create. So mm -hmm. that's what I think a teacher can do. Mm -hmm. But I, I, what I always tell my students is, look, this is not, a scientific formula. Mm -hmm. There's nothing objective about teaching playwriting. Uh, plays have not gotten better in the last, you know, 2,500 years. Oedipus is a great play. Hamlet's a great play. Streetcar Named Desire is a great play. But Streetcar Named Desire is not so much better, if at all, than, than the, those previous plays, right? There's something about the mystery of human life mm -hmm. that uh, we're always trying to represent it, and there is no objective way uh, to, to quantify it. So it's really about teaching my students that they are, if they really want to be artists, uh, they have to be willing to go inside of themselves uh, in a way that will confront them with the things they're most frightened of and confused about, and that they will never know, in a sense, that what they're doing is good. Because what we do is not about good or bad, it's, it's another register, it's another mm -hmm. realm of human experience. Mm -hmm. which which I think a, a mentor can, can mm. help uh, guide this, the, the mm. beginning writer in a way that's really helpful to them. Yeah, I teach as well. I teach at Hunter College and uh, in the graduate theater department. And anybody in the graduate theater department can take playwriting. So they don't necessarily come to me as people who want to be playwrights. They just figure, oh, this sounds like fun. And I'm lucky enough that I have a group of actors who come to the class every week. And so these beginning playwrights, at the start, I give them dizzy 10-minute exercises, get to hear their work read by wonderful writers. And so for them, it's about sort of discovering the latent playwright within in terms of what happens in the class and how the scenes are read and how the class responds to the readings. Um, you know, all you can do is, is sort of, I agree with you, all you can do is sort of encourage them to find their own voice, to locate their, mm -hmm. their talent, their, their particular flavor, and then to celebrate it, you know, in the classroom with, with these other actors and writers. So for me, teaching playwriting is, 
is sort of a, a celebration of, of exploring these different voices for these students who had no idea they had the gift in the first place. Mm -hmm. I didn't study playwriting, but I'm, I would like to. <laughs> I would like to. Yeah. Uh, but I did study acting, you know, uh, pretty seriously with uh, William Asper and Maggie Flanagan and Meisner. And, and, and I think that great teacher, you know, both of whom are great teachers, and what they offered was a way, a method or a way, and an inspiration, you know? Um, and that's, that's uh, I think, what, you know, that's what can, you know, if that's teaching, then that's, you know, that's what's available. And then the rest mm -hmm. is, is up to, it's up to the individual. I tell you though, I you know I did an I did an MFA program, and I, if you can do it, I th if you can do it without driving yourself into impossible debt, I, I always say do it because, you know, I, for a couple of reasons. I mean, I think playwriting, unlike fiction and poetry, I can't you know I can hand you a short story and say you know tell me what you think, but I think you know with playwriting there are a couple big surprises in your future. One is hearing it out loud. Yeah. The next is hearing it on its feet. You know, and it's it's hard to do without a group. Um, but the other thing I, I got out of it that I think was really important was I learned how to behave effectively in a rehearsal room, mm -hmm. um, which took a long time to learn, you know, how to not let the actors see that you're freaking out they're bad, how to talk in a way that doesn't make the director feel like you're running the room. I mean, that mm -hmm. was really valuable stuff for me. Do you write for particular actors? Do you write, do you act what you're writing to see how it plays as you're going through it? What's, what's the relationship for you in terms of these people who ultimately have to interpret your words? I don't write for particular actors. Um, I, I can kind of hear it and feel it as I'm writing it, although sometimes if I'm stuck on something, um, I'm stuck on a speech right now and I am actually mm -hmm. saying it to make sure that I'm asking the actress to say it, I, I, so it, it has to work. And sometimes I'm finding, um, I'll make a little adjustment. You know, I'm, I'm in rehearsal now, and if someone says, oh, can I say a but here, or this just isn't, I know that it wouldn't, you know, it, I've seen the play before, another actress might not ask me to, but I'll make, you know, a little adjustment so that it, it you know, it feels good, and she's the one up there having to say it, so. I mean, Stephen, you have a pretty good idea about a company of actors yeah. who you can write often, for, and you're, often, you're going to get, get Often it I write for people, um, but it's not as much as is perceived. I think it can be an invaluable, you know, it's, 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 it's invaluable, and, but really the question is about the relationship. And I, what's great is, is that if you have some actors that you, that you love or who you love them in your work, you know, um, they can challenge you and you can challenge them. Like f just quickly, for example, uh, there's an actor in our company named David Zayas. He's one of my favorite people, actors in the world. He's been in almost every play I've written. And when it first started together, the first play, you know, David's very funny. So I was like, and I could write funny. And so I was like, this is great. And David talks in a specific way that's kind of funny, you know? But by the second or third play, I was like, well, I don't just want to be funny. You know, there's this stuff that's bothering me. So can I, can I open up and, and write about something that's really means something to me and, and, and challenge myself and then in turn challenge David, you know, to, to take his performance past what he does well. So in a, in a company environment like Labyrinth, when it works, you know, it's, it, we can take each other out of our mm, comfort great. zones, you know, and I can challenge myself and the actors and the director and, you know, and Phil can, you know, and, and it's, that can be really great. Tina, all these years after you said Sarah Lawrence, you're working again with Jane Alexander. I am, I am, I am. Jane, oh man. Jane carries the world inside of her with such grace. I don't understand. The rest of us scream and yell and drool and, Oh, make terrible messes, but Jane just sails on. No, I'm really excited about that. Um, often I have certain actors in mind that I know I'll never get. I, I have this thing for Philip Seymour Hoffman, 
And I know I'll never get them, but that doesn't mean I can't think about them when I write. Um, and I think, I mean, there are various actors that I, that I love and I think about, and I know that they'll be busy or they'll, they won't want to do it, um, but that's all right. Um, I think it helps if you've known actors and, you know, I've worked with Cherry Jones and she keeps saying, write me something, and so she's on my mind. And Diane Weist has been in a number of my plays and she's always on my mind. Um, but in the end, it's sort of about writing about your love for them as that actor, knowing that maybe they aren't going to be able to do the role, which is why you're so lucky that you're part of this group mm -hmm. where you have Just them. calm down. I'm serious. We need, <laughs> we need a writer. We're doing a commercial for Labyrinth. But yeah. actors want to do good things, you know, and, uh, and, and, and we want great actors. I mean, I go into the theater. And I, yes, I carry the play, the direction, the lights is important, but I'm going to see performance. I'm going to see, I want to get, you know, and that's what a great actor can do. And that's what you, if you got that in your play, and if you don't, it can be a different experience. So Chris, I want to ask you, your earliest works were, were first recognized and picked up in England, it seemed. So I'm curious about the experience of you were writing plays set in America for American characters and presumably American actors, was there an experience that you had about, about having that work first voiced by actors who didn't necessarily have the same cultural background as the people you were writing about? Um, well, I think the, the, they've seen so many movies, <laughs> American movies, American pop culture is so influential, that particularly younger actors really ha in Britain have great American accents and they understand American rhythms. And a writer like David Mamet was so influential there in that kind of American rhythm and understanding of, of, uh, of how we talk. Uh, I think that led the actors to, uh, to my work pretty easily. So I didn't have much difficulty. I mean, I think if an American audience would hear them, they would think oh, that that's not quite how we do it. But in general, they do a really good job of approximating American rhythm, I think it's basically because of the influence of, uh, of pop culture. The other key relationship for any writer would seem to be that with the director. And I'm wondering how you each find or have found directors or were directors found for you? They were arranged marriages mm -hmm. that, that then you had to explore. Um, Lisa, I see you nodding, so yeah, I'll ask you. Well, um, I, I, for me, it uh, sometimes is an arranged marriage. I'm in an arranged marriage right now with Mark Brokaw, which is a very happy marriage. Oh, he's wonderful. He's wonderful. But, you know, it is a, it's a real process because you don't, um, I'm, I, I know some of his work, I don't know a lot, and I don't know how much of mine he knew. And you really have to take some time to understand someone's sensibility, you know, when they're saying, gee, I think, I, I don't want this to be sentimental, for instance. What does sentimental mean to this person? You know, what every, every director has his own taste, his own prejudices, and uh, it's a, it, is a, it is a fascinating relationship. And also, I'm, I was interested in, you know, what you were saying, right. too, about how you are in the room. You know, the director has also to come to trust you. He doesn't know whether to listen. I mean, I, I'm, I'm someone, I'm a compulsive note taker. And of course, maybe the first time I, I offered notes, he didn't know whether he should be like tossing them or saying thank you very much or taking them to heart because he doesn't know um, my sensibility or how I perceive things or what my prejudices are. So it is a it is a real learning experience, and I think it's a a wonderful thing when you when you have as you probably do in Labyrinth, which sounds so great when you are working with the same people again and again, and you do have a shorthand, and you don't have to go through that whole process of well, who are you? And because you, you start dating right? after the marriage yeah, in exactly. some cases, exactly right. Uh. Yeah, I mean, the director I'm working with now, Peter Dubois, I went to graduate school with, mm. so, and is one of my best friends, and, you know, so, I mean, it's, that's an amazing thing to have. I mean, yeah. we, we, there are no surprises in the room, you know, I mean, yeah. we, we know how each other work. Um, I mean, I will say in terms of, you know, what's okay for the playwright to do in the room, what's not, I mean, my sort of general rule is, you know, you speak to the director, not the actors, yes. but that being said, you know, I mean, well, I, I, you know, I have had experiences where I think I was, the director wanted less of me, but first of all, I think on a new play, 
if you want less of the playwright, you're very foolish. Yeah. But also, they pay you a lot of money in film and TV to shut up and leave. Mm. Uh, part of the reason I'm mm. doing plays is that I have something to say, you know? Mm -hmm. And I know when it's the fifth production of After Ashley, I'm not gonna be there, but for the first one, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm there, you know? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> they, better, they better want me there. Chris, your experience with finding relationships with directors? Well, I think starting in England, the, the Royal Court, that's a, a, a theater designed to honor the writer. I was really treated like I was the most important person for my very first play when I was 23 years old there. So I got used to being, mm -hmm. to being the center. Um, and, I, and I found that I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed everybody coming to me. What did I intend? What, what, why did I do what I did? It was a little bit of a rough transition coming to America where the director has a little more authority. And um, you know, subsequently, I've, I've, there are a lot of good American directors, but I've worked with a few British directors here. I directed one of my own plays myself because I really loved uh, my experience in England of, of really being the most important person uh, in the room. And uh, I haven't always found that with the American directors I've worked with. And that's been frustrating for me mm -hmm. on occasion. When I started at The Public, Joe Papp gave me um, Max Stafford Clark, um, who had done a lot of work with um, Carol Churchill and was of the opinion that you sort of all do it together, that you sort of create the script together, and that was not the way I perceived things. So we had some uh, hair-raising times, but, but he was very smart and classy, and so that was all right. And then I was given A.J. Antoon for um, The Art of Dining, and then um, then I left the public theater and I found Carol Rothman who runs the second stage and she directed four of my plays and, mm -hmm. and there was tremendous empathy and understanding between us because we were, you know, we're very different, we're strung very different emotionally and we certainly are very different in terms of height, but she was very canny in terms of mining my voice and so I worked with her sort of in my mid-career and now um, I've been working with directors who um, are e either suggested by the theater or by my agent. Um, Michael Wilson is going to be doing my Chasing Man A play, and he's um, he's wonderfully adept and smart. It's kind of exciting, actually, to have a different variety of directors, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and it's very important to learn how to behave. And that's one of the things mm -hmm. I find that's very missing in terms of graduate study for playwrights. Mm -hmm. That we're very good at helping them turn out that script in the room, but when it comes to actually collaborating you know, with the actors and the directors, they don't have a clue. And I often wish somebody could give a course in guerrilla theater. It would mm -hmm. just be so helpful. Well, as you talk about it, here, here we have five playwrights. What would you say to younger playwrights, aspiring playwrights, about, about how they should work with directors, and, and indeed in situations where perhaps the director isn't necessarily doing what you think should be done with your play. Well, I think it's like what they say about uh, a play is 90% casting. Mm -hmm. For the playwright, choosing the director is 90% of mm -hmm. it too, because right. I think the director is the conduit you know, between you and the actors. And if the director doesn't know how to talk to actors, if the director doesn't know how to engage in a collaborative, spontaneous way, it's going to be a difficult collaboration. So you know, the, the, I think the biggest mistakes I've made in my career went, or when I went with a director who I didn't really have full faith in. Um, so that is the most, I think, the most important thing for any playwright is to get to know your director, get to know what they think about the play, and get to know how they work with actors. Talk mm -hmm. to actors who've worked with them. It's amazing to me, after I had one bad experience, and then people started telling me, oh yeah, that director, you know, that they, they don't know how to talk to actors. And well, God, why didn't I know this before, you know? There's not a website to go There's, to. Well, <laughs> not yet, maybe there should be. Well, and not, you know. You know, I, kind of, I had this, I, you know, the one bad experience I had, I didn't check references, and if I had, I mean, I, I ran into playwrights in the, you know, <laughs> years later, oh God, you survived that too, and I thought, why didn't I make mm. one phone call, two phone calls, mm. but I think I was, young and I was so grateful for the yeah. production yeah. Mm -hmm. that I thought I shouldn't ask any questions. Mm -hmm. And that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've all had multiple productions of mm -hmm. your plays in multiple venues, multiple directors, cities, countries. At what point do you let a show go? Mm. Well, I learned that. I mean, when it's done in New York, mm -hmm. that's the optimal time to let it go, unless it goes to London. 
Uh, you know, they do a separate then. But I, I learned that early on because I, I went to see a regional production of one of my plays in, in a theater that I was, you know, enamored of. I uh, was very excited and, and my girlfriend at the time, we went together and, you know, it was really exciting and the lights went down and, <laughs> and uh, you know, it was, it was, it was, it wasn't very good, you know, and, <laughs> and, uh, and my girlfriend was just like, you know, this isn't, this isn't about you, you know, your work is done. And I was like, and so then I was like, all right. And, but then after the show, you know, they were so excited that I was there and this and that and the party and everybody was like, wanted to know how it was. And, uh, and the actors, <laughs> they came up and they were like, you know, how was it? What did you think? How did it compare to New York? <laughs> And, 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 and my girlfriend at the time, she just put this big smile on her face, and she's like, oh, honey, you really made it your own. Like, <laughs> but, like and they were like, so happy, and I was like, you really made it your own, really made it your own. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you made it your own, you know? And, <laughs> and then since then, it's like a, it's a joy. I, I don't know about you guys, but I find that the most, arguably, one of the mo most satisfying thing about being a playwright is that if it if play lands in any way, yeah. it gets performed all over, in little places, all over the place, and that people who otherwise wouldn't get together, they get together and have an experience mm -hmm. because you wrote something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when you start to view it th through that prism, which mm -hmm. is really the only prism, you go and you're just like, it doesn't matter how good it is. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's just, it matters like that you enjoy the heart that goes into it, mm -hmm. you know? I totally agree. I think there's there's two things. I mean, you want to go and see your play and have it be the way you want it to be, and you want it to be wonderful. And that's that's important, and it's heartbreaking when it's not. But there's this other level of that you don't know. You just, you don't know how it's, the audience, this audience may really be enjoying it even though it's not the way you want it to be. And you don't know how that, what, what's happening in that group of actors who've come together. I have an actress in a, in, a, in a play now. It's changed her life to be able to come back to the theater. You know, there's, there's a lot going on in a production besides just, is it the perfect production of the play? It's a mammogram thing that you said yeah. before. Yeah, it's people's you don't, lives. You don't, you don't know. know. And now, because of Facebook, sometimes you can get to know. You get these things, and you're like, <laughs> on days where you feel like, you know, I'm, and then you get a, a note from somebody that you don't know. Yeah. And they're, you know, and you're like, all right. I just you got know. a little packet from that. one of my students who teaches at a high school in Carmel, New York, and she sent, she sent me a packet of letters that her students had written after they read um, The Art of Dining. Oh, and it's, they're heartbreaking, they're heartbreaking. I, yeah, why, did, why is the publisher married when he talks to this wonderful neurotic writer? And why does he have to be married? They should have gone off together. And just their, yeah. their enthusiasm and the sweetness of it. And it makes you weep. I agree that it's about them. Well, I Facebook. Anyone who's, if I see a little theater somewhere is doing a play of mine, I go on Facebook, I look them up, the actors, the director, and I will friend them to open myself to them. Because I, I still want the play to be what I intended as much as possible. I know I can't control oh. it, and it's silly to do that. Uh -huh. But I always say, look, if you have any questions at any time, just send mm -hmm. me a message, oh, and I'm happy to great. answer it. And most people do take me up on that. Yeah. And they'll say, we're in week two, and this is the question. And I think it, it really makes them feel like they're collaborating in some way with this playwright. I mean, technology has allowed these sort of quasi-collaborations to happen, which I think uh, are really exciting, and they make me feel that I have sort of investments in these little, what little productions around the country. It's really idea. cool. Well, it's funny. I was going to. Oh, I'm sorry. I, Can I just quickly add that I've also seen many like outstanding productions of my work yeah. and other people's yeah. work. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that, but you know yeah. the you, you are, the ego, and you know it's 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 part. You know, sure. but I have a lot, and and mm -hmm. it's inspiring as well. As you talk about this, you're mentioning Facebook, you know, John Patrick Shanley puts his email address in his bio in every program, no which kidding. seems to me quite daunting. Do you want that level of engagement, not only with, with your companies, <laughs> but with, with the audiences that do your work? Would you want to hear directly from them? I like it. I do like it. I mean, I think it's one of the great things about technology is it's, it's kind of evened everybody out. 
Things are transparent. Everybody's reachable in some way. I mean, I, I got some very bad reviews of Hedda Gobbler, as I mentioned, but I noticed that some critics got some things wrong. They criticized something I did in a translation, but I, I knew that they didn't actually know the original Norwegian. So I emailed quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. And all but one wrote me back, and it was very respectful and, and very pleasant, actually. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is great. This is a way of communicating, of, of, of tearing down boundaries that used to exist between audiences, uh, artists, cri critics. And I, and I think that's immensely exciting. I mean, it can get a little exhausting. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. to, to keep you know staying on the email, but but I really like the very egalitarian spirit of it all. Hmm. I would hate it. I would hate. I don't do Facebook, <laughs> and when and whenever I'm in previews with one of my plays, I always sit next to the people who hate it. Always, always. <laughs> they are there. They are right next to me. Can you believe this show? <laughs> oh God! <laughs> uh, you want to go out and get some Thai afterwards? Every time I am. So no, no, no. I want to be hidden. I don't want anyone. Because they come to me, the, the haters are drawn to me the way cats are. I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> I go into a house, they're all over me. And I mean, the audience, I'm terrified of the audience. I'm terrified mm. of them. I, 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 want, I, like, I would like to hide too, but oddly for me, I, I find the praise um, equally uncomfortable. Oh, I can't listen to it. You, you don't hear it, do I you? Well, I, I you know, because like occasionally, I think, you know, I get very, very nice uh, email messages on Facebook, because if you hate my play, you know, usually you're not going to look me up on Facebook and be like, I hate it, you know. But I get the, and, you know, I read, a, I read one sentence and I see how wonderful it is, and I almost like, I'll freeze up and I don't want to, I don't, you know, I don't want to see. And I don't know what that's about. I really, and I was thinking about it the other day, because I was remembering, you know, when James Cameron won the, Oscar for directing um, Titanic, and he got up there and he went, I'm the king of the world. <laughs> and I thought, why, why can't I be that guy? Like, because I, I, I'm just sort of like, oh, you know. You well, like didn't me. Didn't you say like earlier, everybody <laughs> at the table probably has self-esteem issues? Yeah, you know, but my, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. My, yeah. my mom, I remember she always used to tell me, never be afraid to give somebody a compliment. Um, because you never know when they might need it. Yeah, and I want to loop back because Gina said it very early about writing and the people she writes and and respects are are the group a group of other playwrights. How much are other playwrights resources, mentors, support for you all? Do you do you use each other, not just the people at this table, but is that opportunity there, or are you all writing alone? I write, I write alone, but I've come over the years to see and appreciate relationships with, with other writers. I, I started out, I didn't like writers. I was an actor, I liked actors, and writers, mm -hmm. which is, I always felt they were smarter than me, this and that. But uh, over the years, you know, there's writers who, e who have either, you know, who were above me, who sort of came down to... Uh, introduce themselves and that I learn from and then people that are my peers and then people that are younger and it is uh, it is it is a feel that only only we get a glimpse of what the other person is going through and so uh, in terms of support uh, in terms of oftentimes a challenge like you got an email from Martin McDonough the other night where he said you know my new play is coming to New York and it's about Americans I'm taking over your town <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not in, in, in the, in the, with a big smile, you know, and, and maybe competition to some degree keeps you honest where you see, you know, I saw Chris's play or Gina's play, and I'm not coming from a place of jealousy, but like, you know, you see stuff when you're like, oh, they just set a bar. And so, you know, I want to meet that, you know, mm -hmm. um, very helpful. There's that, but also, you know, when, when I've gotten reviews that, um, I thought might just stop me <laughs> from writing. <clears throat> um, there, you know, I called my old only O'Neill playwright friends who had gotten bad reviews and kept writing in the face of them, and it was very important for me to talk to them about how you do that. And you know, I was at the Writers Guild Awards the other night, seeing John Patrick Shanley get a, a Lifetime Achievement Award, and it was interesting to you know see this little retrospective on his career because certainly you forget that he had lows. Like you think about his mm. highs, you forget that there were mm -hmm. lows, and he just got up again. You know, so that that's helpful for me. Mm. Well, um, this conversation is making me want to move back to New York because I don't live in a place where I have that 
um, community of writers around me right now. Um, I did for a while when I lived in Los Angeles. I, 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 the Mark Taper Forum was like a, a home for me. Um, but I miss it, and and I do think that it's in in those in those difficult moments, another writer can help you the way no one else can. I'm on the council of the Dramatists Guild, and you know it's all of the sort of living playwrights and composers and lyricists and book writers, and um, we need each other and we communicate with each other. Issues come up. Some you know people critics review shows before they've opened and before they were supposed to be there and there's a great hue and cry and so we're we're very involved with each other in terms of our rights in terms of in terms of of our of our the road that we have to hoe and we and we support each other sometimes somebody recently got a bad review An, another one of our members wrote an email to everybody on the on the council saying this is so unfair you must see this play so i think we sense that that we are out there with our fingers interlaced in one way or another and it's and it's huge it's huge i particularly like helping younger writers who who are lonely who don't know anybody who all they have is their work and they're frightened and they're confused and if i get an email uh, from from someone who wants me to read their play i always try to do it to sort of try to welcome them in to this community because it's a pretty good community and, and uh, you know I, I feel a particular responsibility to that younger generation who, who wants to join it someday. Mm. Well speaking on behalf of the audience let me say that whether it is at times embarrassing to hear or helps your self-esteem thank you all for your plays and also for being here today. And thank you for joining us. These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, I'm Howard Sherman, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. I'm Ted Chapin, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing. The Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. Best known for creating the Tony Awards, we stand for excellence but we also support education in the theater, and our work reaches beyond Broadway in New York. The Working in the Theater television programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are unequaled forums for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth radio interviews were created in conjunction with XM Satellite Radio and can be heard on our website. Our annual theater company grants support New York not-for-profits and since they began, have distributed nearly $3 million. We are also pleased to be the home of the Jonathan Larson Grants, which support emerging composers and lyricists. For people who are starting their careers, we have a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country called Springboard NYC. And our theater intern group provides a forum for young people who are starting their careers to build a professional network. All of the American Theatre Wing's educational and media programs are available for free on demand from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Thanks for your interest in the Wing, and thanks for watching.